very telling. There's two sides to every story and always pay attention to not just what is being said, but what is not being said. And right now, Eben is very silent. Hi everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel and welcome back if you've been here before. My name is Alexis and on this channel I cover important lessons and takeaways that I get from viral topics. Today I wanted to talk about Ebbing, New York. Recently, Ebbing, New York has been under fire because two of the former black female employees came out and talked about how they were mistreated while working with Ebbing, New York. So for those of you who might not know, Ebbing, New York is a Korean-owned hair care company that mainly caters to black women i'm not sure if i should say mainly caters to but your main target clientele would be black women based on how they market themselves so it was very surprising to see two black women come out and talk about how badly they were treated and mistreatment goes from verbal abuse to being misunderstood to um, even business ideas being stolen according to one of them a lady named samaya She's planning on taking legal actions because they were wrongfully terminated. And the other lady, whose name is Samani, I'm not sure if she's going to join in in the lawsuit. Black Women Incorporate, it's really not a secret for any of us who have been incorporated that it's a different world out there and it's very tough. Even though black women stay employed and we know how to keep a job, it's still very much, very tricky. And I would say you have to code switch a lot. A lot of times as a black woman, you will be alone in a corporate space or you will be the only black woman in a work environment. Things like this make it even more complicated. There's just nobody else you can turn to who's just like you, nobody else you can relate to. And you're just pretty much alone and it's very competitive and you have to deal with all these other different groups and personalities. A lot of times, people of those different groups and ethnicities do not really care to get to know a black woman and where we come from. Even though as a black woman, you have to very much change who you are to kind of fit in with everybody else. I believed every word of Samaya and Imani's story because they talked about working for a Korean-owned company. When you, as a black woman, work in corporate, it's very easy to realize that you are very much alone. And another thing that you have to come to the realization very quickly is that the toughest competition will not be a white person. It would primarily be people from other minority groups, other POC, people of color, non-black POC. Even sometimes black POC would be one of the first people to maybe throw you under the bus just so they can be closer to the boss or something like that. So very quickly, as a black woman in corporate, you realize that there's no such thing as POC solidarity. And we're pretty much not, you know, we're all competing for like a seat at the table or like to be at the top. And that makes it even more gut-wrenching. So when Samaya came out with the story that she was being mistreated in a Korean-owned company, unfortunately, that made a lot of sense to me. Because I'm not saying that if it was a non-Korean-owned or if it was a white-owned company, she wouldn't be mistreated. But I really believe that it wouldn't have been just as bad. There's so much spotlight on white-owned companies and how they treat black employees that they try not to overdo the mistreatment. But other POC companies, they don't really care. And they don't really put in the work to even educate themselves on other POCs because in your mind, they're also minorities. With all that being said, let me go ahead and get into some of the key lessons that I learned with this whole entire situation. Number one, I would say if as a black woman, you walk into a corporate environment and you are the first black or the only black person in there. I know the job market is terrible right now. I will understand if as a black woman, you would want to stay, but it's not a good look. It's not a good sign. If you as a black woman walk into any space, not even just corporate, but just any space for that matter, as an adult dealing with other adults and you find out that you are the only black anything it's not a good sign it's not if you are a black person but i would say mainly a black woman because i think a lot of times black men are very comfortable being the only black person in the room but i would say as a black woman we are a little less likely to be comfortable with that and the treatment that comes with being the only black person so if you're a black woman, you walk into any environment and you are the first black or the only black, 
if there's any chance that you have any other options but that i would suggest you go find something else because it's very telling if a adult or a company that has been around for years only seem to have one black person at the time it's just very weird because yes i know as black women we are in a minority here in the u.s but it's still a lot of us i can see why maybe it's not always possible because we live in a predominantly white country and sometimes you would have to be the only black person so when i say that i don't really blame the black person who accepts the role but me personally i think it's a problem so we have to be very careful walking into a corporate space being the only black person or the first black person ever that says a lot and i don't think that's a company that can be trusted my next point is everybody in corporate is in competition with one another I would say a lot of times it's a healthy competition because people can still be friends, but it can still be slightly backstabbing, especially if it's a big company where people want to get recognition. In this case, in the story of Samaya, she walked into this environment where she was the only black person at the time, and she started doing a really great job. And I think that made a lot of the uh, Korean employees at Eben feel very insecure where they were in competition with her and they didn't want her to outshine them too much so they just wanted her to do enough to bring the company to the next level but they didn't want her to have control over her progress like they wouldn't give her credit and things like that and all of that is competition it's just being a korean owned company and seeing this woman who's not korean coming in there and uh, working towards even becoming something bigger than what she started off as that animosity started from there and they wanted to break her spirit and they wanted to do all these different things to even make her quit even though eventually they had to fire her one thing that i feel like a lot of people don't talk enough about is how sometimes it's complicated when somebody looks at you and feel like you don't deserve to be in a certain position there's a lot of competition and that competition becomes tougher on us since everybody believes that we don't have that much to offer sometimes or we are not as smart and then we always end up proving people wrong and the animosity towards us just become 10 times more because now jealousy is involved because we can actually get the work done so i would say black women getting into corporate spaces just consider that competition is heavy competition is tight competition is hard on people who nobody believed they could do anything Competition is harder on the people who everybody thought were useless. When you start showing your skills and abilities and intelligence and all of that, that makes people even more competitive. My next point is HR is absolutely not your friend. And I've been hearing that a lot lately. HR is there to protect the company. HR is there to make sure that the company looks good. HR is a good liaison in between upper management and employees. But at the end of the day, upper management is the boss to everybody including people who work at hr you're always gonna be working for the people who are in control which is upper management i keep going back to Eben being korean owned but that's really to me that's one of the biggest issues here because it was not just korean owned but the company was focused around korean work ethic and they were just doing things based on what they know and based on what your culture encourages them to do speak korean on the job and things like that so they didn't care they were just working based on your own you know korean standards and that was difficult on samaya but she couldn't really talk about it because when she talked about it to hr it seemed like it became a problem so in this scenario i think it's very important to note that hr is not the friend of regular employees they are working for upper management upper management probably hired them and that's who they work for my next point is that Sometimes I feel like black women are sometimes included or invited or hired not to be taken seriously, but just to be put in your place. I think it's not lost on anyone who's paying attention to the trends that black women are really getting educated. Black women can open businesses. Black women are very capable. And I think sometimes companies don't even have to hire a black person because they can get away with not having a black person on your team. I think Eben New York is one of those companies that could have gotten away with this. Because we, a lot of black women that I know who used Eben just used it. I don't think they ever really cared. Like it's not one of those companies where everybody just kind of went and Googled the CEO. I don't even think that most black women Google the CEOs of the companies that they buy from. 
nobody was going to care if they didn't have any black person on the team, I believe. So I don't really understand why they always felt the need to have a black person there just to mistreat them. And I feel like companies sometimes do that to black women specifically, where they would hire one black person, have them be the only black person and mistreat them so badly that they make them not want to work again. I'm not speaking for everybody. Please do not get me wrong. Some companies are actually very fair. I think there's a lot of companies who hire black people and they're not biased. But then you have companies like Eben that would hire a black person, in my opinion, just to kind of put them in your place or they will hire a black person just to fill up space. And they know freaking well that your intention is to mistreat that black person and to have them eventually quit. So oh, I think black women, especially in the corporate world, need to think about this. You might think that you've been included and invited to things. You might think that you've been hired from your own merit, but oh, it seems like you're just kind of there to be the one person that everybody can mistreat or everybody can talk down to to release your stress or whatever. I'm, not, I'm noticing this a lot sometimes where, where black women talk about corporate spaces. They talk about the disrespect that they get and it just feels like black women were being invited and included or hired just to be put in your place my next point is that one of the oldest bullying tactics that corporate does on some of the employees is to make you uncomfortable and bully you to the point of wanting to quit because in samaya's story she continuously talked about how she wanted to quit and she was crying a lot and things like that I don't think they were just doing that by mistake. I don't think the people who were talking down on her, mistreating her, including the CEO too, who was really disrespected towards her based on her story. I don't think all of that was just, you know, because they had a bad attitude, which I think they had a really bad attitude. But I think when they started noticing how she was starting to stand up for herself, they didn't want to fire her just like that. So they were making stuff up to make her uncomfortable enough to quit. And... Sometimes when you incorporate, you have to pay attention to how people are reacting to you to know if you're about to get laid off or things like that. Sometimes you have to pay attention to if people are trying to get you to quit. And I think a few months into her starting to work for Eben, they were already planning things for her to quit. She talked about how when she would talk to people, they wouldn't respond. She talked about feeling lonely and excluded. She talked about always having to work in her own space. She talked about the fact that they were speaking Korean in the office and during the meetings, which made her feel excluded from the company, which makes sense. I mean, everybody will feel excluded in a situation like that. So this is what some corporate people do. They will try to do everything to make you uncomfortable for you to quit. And then New York went ahead and fired Samaya and Imani. And now they're talking about the lawsuit because of wrongful termination, which makes sense. And they might actually win if they go through with it because if they have evidence of everything that they talked about in those videos, it's pretty bad. It is. My next point is that there's actually two sides to every story. And we always have to watch out to the party who doesn't want to be transparent. In this case, with Ebony New York and Sumaya and Imani, Ebony New York hasn't come out and said much. It's very telling. I'm willing to believe that there's two sides to every story. But when they're silent... On something this serious what are we supposed to think to me that is low-key an admission of guilt they have some measly statement some very silly worthless piece of statement that they have on your website I think a lot of people are waiting for a response from them and right now we're not getting any it speaks volume I think they're just indirectly admitting that it was true and they might just go forward and maybe start a new company or just rebrand. It doesn't seem like they're sorry. I don't think they care. They haven't said anything. They haven't tried to defend themselves. They haven't talked about your side of the story. They don't have a representative to come out and speak on your behalf. Nothing. It's just that. Very telling. There's two sides to every story and always pay attention to not just what is being said, but what is not being said. And right now, Eben is very silent. They had this one guy come out and try to speak up for them but he has no place to talk because he wasn't even working directly with them so they're very silent and that's very telling and i really hope people will boycott them for good my next point is that people's country of birth people's ethnicity people's race people's background should not be an excuse for them to mistreat anybody 
the reason why I say that is because sometimes I've noticed that some immigrant, and I am an immigrant too, and that's how I've, I was able to notice that some immigrants would use the fact that they're from a different country to justify their being rude. I don't think that should work that way, especially in a corporate environment. I do not care if you're from Korea. I do not care if that's how they do it where you're from. You're in a whole new country and you're dealing with somebody who's not from Korea and they deserve just as much respect. So I think sometimes minorities, like immigrants specifically, use ethnicity as an excuse. I hate that. I myself, I am an immigrant. I am Central African. And no way am I ever going to justify mistreating people because I'm from that part of the world. The message that you're sending as somebody, as an immigrant, is that where I'm from, people are just this nasty. And you should just expect it. No, 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 no. No, no. That don't mean a freaking thing. Everywhere around the world, we have nice people, good people, genuine people, respectful people. Stop pretending as if your ethnicity is like a justification for you being a complete douchebag. Stop pretending as if your ethnicity is the reason why you don't know how to talk to other people. Stop pretending as if your ethnicity is the reason why you are xenophobic or racist or anything of that nature. I've heard Samaya herself say that she thought at some point that maybe it's because they're Korean that they do things differently. And I just want to let anybody know, especially black women in corporate, black American women who have never really worked with other people around the world, that's not an excuse. Nice people come from every ethnicity. And if somebody is mean to you, that's just because that's who they are. It's no such thing as maybe it's because they're Hispanic or maybe it's because they're Korean or maybe it's because they're Chinese or whatever. No, 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 no. Like, there's no rule that says that if you're Chinese, you have to be rude. There's no rules that say that if you're Jamaican, you have to be rude. Ethnicity, race, and any of that should not be an excuse to mistreat people. And I was really disappointed to hear Samaya kind of make that excuse, but it's okay. I hope she eventually learns how not to let people like Nisidi be the justification behind them not treating her well. My next point is that I think black people, especially black women, have a tendency of waiting on the next scandal to speak up and to talk about black issues when it comes to the way a lot of these, especially Asian-owned companies, treat black women. And I wish we would stop doing that. We shouldn't wait on the scandal to talk about our issues. We shouldn't wait on the scandal to boycott Companies who we know do not have our best interests at heart. I feel like a lot of times black women do not do proper research before investing your money into a company. And that's how we end up with places like Eben that don't care. Everybody on the team, especially on the upper level, higher management team is, you know, Korean, which is a lot of times white or a little brown skin Asian. They're not quite black. You understand? As black women, we need to stop waiting until the very worst happens before we want to take action. And what's actually sad is that I don't even think that black women are actually going to boycott. I think black women are going to speak about it for a while and then come back and start using that product again. Matter of fact, I don't even think all black women have stopped using the product. I'm pretty sure your business will be affected. I just don't know to what extent because I don't believe that all black women have given up on Evan. We're still over here talking about them giving us forgiveness. They're not going to. And even if they do, they're not going to mean it because they were full-blown adult mistreating Samaya and Imani and all the other black people who work for them. They're not going to do right by us. And I just want black women to remember that all day, every day. I want us to have that in the back of our mind when it comes to buying from a certain business. I hope having that in the back of our mind would encourage us to direct our attention and money onto black-owned businesses and things like that. But... We shouldn't be waiting on anything from them. We shouldn't want anything from these other groups. They are who they are. They've always been who they were. I really hope black men will stop waiting for bad things to happen before boycotting these brands. We shouldn't be investing in them as much as we do to begin with. My next point is that even when it comes to justice within the black community, especially with black women, we still have our little preferences. And we still have what we consider the perfect victim to whom we give preferential treatments. For example, I would say we have the story of Rosa Parks and how the original person who refused to give up a seat on the bus was Claudette Colvin because she didn't look good on the newspapers. Her story was on front page, but instead Rosa Parks was... Some might even say Rosa Parks' story was fabricated just so 
we can have a woman who's more palatable to all audiences. And this can actually be a story that can be in the history books forever. But nonetheless, the first person to ever refuse to give up her seat was Claudette Colvin. She was 15 at the time, very young. She was pregnant and she just wasn't a good look. In my opinion, I feel like the only reason why, not the only, but I feel like one of the reasons why Samaya's story got all this attention while Imani didn't really get as much attention is because Samaya was a little less Afrocentric looking. Samaya is clearly a black woman, but you can see how even her features are a little less Afrocentric than Imani. And I'm noticing that with this whole story, Samaya is the face of it, which to be fair, she's the first person who came out. But Imani's story to me was a little more intense because Imani is the one who actually provided business ideas to Eben. And she got snubbed and she got fired and she was silent for the longest. And I even saw people trying to victim blame her more than they tried to victim blame Samaya. And it just kind of reminded me that in the black community, we really have these biases sometimes. And I'm not saying that people weren't coming to support them both. I think people respected the stories at large, but I really wish I would have seen more of Imani and people talking about her experience. And I have a feeling that if Imani had a little bit of the same look as Samaya, she would get more shine because people like that look. Samaya received the most TikTok followers and received the most attention and the most care. And I just didn't see the same amount of love and support being directed to Imani. Even though her story was just as intense, if not even more intense. Because she had examples upon examples upon examples. But hey, both of those women have been through a lot. And I respect both of them. This is just a little observation that I've made. Maybe it has nothing to do with what I just said. Maybe Imani's story just weren't getting light or clout like that. So I don't know. My next point is that by now everybody should know this. But the men within my community, black men, are really of no support to us whatsoever. With this whole story, we don't see a lot of men coming out to support us. Some people might argue that hair care and beauty has nothing to do with men, so they don't care. And that's the problem. Because if this story has to do with her as a black man being mistreated because she was black, it would be beneficial to us to all have a united front. But the men of this community are never supportive. Matter of fact, some of them will be the first ones to stand against the women. We saw that with the guy who came out, his name was Antoine Johnson. He doesn't even work for Eben directly. He doesn't work with them closely. He doesn't work with them face to face. He doesn't connect with them the way Samaya had to work with them. Antoine Johnson came out ready to make Samaya look like a liar. Like she wasn't a victim. And yes, there's no such thing as a perfect victim. So... I think he was trying to make it seem like she's not perfect, so she's not credible. She's completely credible, especially if she has evidence of everything that she said. Like, huh? That's just another example of how the men of our community are very, very, very disingenuous. They are always willing to side with people of other groups and never have our backs and never take our issues seriously. It was very disappointing to watch because everybody's having Samaya's back and there he comes. And he doesn't even have evidence that she's lying. He just talks about how she's not perfect and how she ruined a lot of people's lives. Like, the victim blaming of it all. We really didn't need that. We know this is how a lot of the men within our community are, but it's very disappointing to always see it when it happens. My next point is that when it comes to the corporate world, the abuse is never right off the bat. The abuse is gradual. When you get into these spaces, you get all the compliments and you get treated like the cream of the crop. That's how you get introduced to the company. And then the abuse just starts developing with time. It starts with little jokes that you might not like or that make you feel uncomfortable. And it goes from there. Before you know it, some things have been told to you that you don't like and you don't want to accept. And it's too late. Like you've been in the company for a while and you just keep giving them chances after chances after chances. So... It's a loser situation. The abuse doesn't start overnight. It's gradual. It starts very nicely. And then. Things start going sour. Very quickly. The abuse takes time. And eventually you just find yourself like. What just happened? Like, How did I end up in this position? 
like a lot of other relationships but this is corporate. My next point is that other communities really think like capitalists in a way that black people do not, especially black women. When Imani mentioned that she was providing business ideas to people who are working at her company and they took her business ideas and created them and never give her credit, that's how capitalists work. That's how a lot of people have managed to become billionaires, taken from others. You don't even have to do actual work because the people who do the actual work somehow don't end up billionaires because they're the ones who are being exploited. Black women don't think like capitalists. And because of that, people see it and they take advantage of it. Other groups of people have that entrepreneurial mind where everything that they have to create, they want to make money from it. Black women don't. So it's very easy to take advantage of us that way. I would say I really want black men to learn how to put a monetary value on everything that they got to offer. As of now, it's very easy to make a black woman share her ideas. A lot of us don't even think about it as money. Even I myself, there would be multiple times when I was willing to do a job just to help somebody. And then they had to turn around and tell me that they were going to pay me for it. And I was like, oh, thank you. But I wasn't asking for money at first. And I should have because it was my time I was putting into helping them out. I think black women need to learn how to have that hungry mindset of always ready to put a dollar price on what you got to sell. And a lot of people might disagree, but we also have to keep in mind that a lot of people who disagree with this, with what I'm saying, might also think about your best interests. I think it's very beneficial to other groups when black women do not stand up for themselves. It's very beneficial when black women do not put value on their ideas, on what they can accomplish especially not monetary value because nobody wants to pay us our price. My next point is that we should never accept a verbal agreement on anything. Always sign a piece of paper, always have some type of documentation, paper trail of everything you've done, of everything that was going on in the company. Every work that you've done, every contract you sign, have physical evidence, physical proof. I think it was Imani who mentioned that she did a lot of work that she never got paid for. And it was kind of hard to prove that she did the work because it was a verbal agreement in between her and some of the managers that she was going to do the work and get paid. But they never kept the word and paid the money properly. Never go by verbal agreement, especially in the corporate space. If any manager or anybody wants you to go by verbal agreement, they're probably scamming you. Don't do it. So that's a really good lesson to learn, especially for the new college graduates who are now getting into your first positions. Never do anything that's not on paper. When it comes to these companies, never do anything that's not on paper. And if they cannot do it without a verbal agreement, if they cannot put anything on paper legally, then whatever opportunity that is, trust me, that's not for you because you might end up paying a bigger price. Now for my next point, and this is my final point, sometimes people, especially in the corporate space, treat black women as if we can get paid with words and that should be enough. At some point in her story, Imani mentioned that somebody on the management team at Eben jokingly called her the face of the company. Oh, I don't even know if it was a joke. And she didn't like that. That happens a lot. That reminds me of how Viola Davis was talking about some movie executive calling her the Black Mary Strip. There's no such thing as the Black Mary Strip. She's Viola Davis. Respect her name. She was talking about how they would call her the Black Mary Strip but not pay her Mary Strip money. I feel like a lot of companies do that to black women a lot. We get all these compliments. We get talked about in such a positive light, but we never get the raise that matches the compliment. So if it was only based on what people got to say, black women are some of the most loved group of people on the planet. And I believe that, yes, we are very much admired, but the money doesn't match the words. We need the money. Pay us our price. I don't know who was calling her the face of the company, but whoever that is, you pay her a price. If she's going to be the face of the company, pay her face of the company money so she can be the face. But no, and people do that to us as black women a lot. Like they will just bother you up and compliment you. And it's such a slap in the face because we are women and uh, we need more than just words. It's not like some little school girl who just want to hear how beautiful she is. And that's enough for her because she don't even got to pay bills. She probably lives with her parents or something. No, we as women, black women, we have a lot of responsibilities. And it would be nice if we get paid our price. As far as I'm concerned, you don't even need to give me compliments. The amount of money that you're going to pay me is going to tell me how much you value me. I wish we would get to that point where people would just pay us our price and stop with the whole 
giving us that kind of compliments. The compliments are sweet, but trust me, the money will be better. So those were some of my important lessons and takeaways that I got from this whole situation with Eben. Do not do too much. Do not offer yourself too much. With upper management of your budget, they don't care. If it's a company that doesn't care, they're not going to just stop caring overnight. When the abuse starts, if you cannot put up with it, just go. It's not worth it. Don't stay, just go. And with that being said, I am very appreciative. Please go ahead and like, comment, subscribe. And I would joyfully catch you in the next video. Bye.